The Lord promised David, the king, that he would have a son, that his son would raise up and sit on the throne of David, and that he would have an everlasting kingdom. He will reign on the throne of David forever. In this lesson entitled, Son of David, we're going to show you who that son actually was. There are notes for this lesson. I will leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click the link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. But the Kojic Legacy edition of the Sunday school is now in session. You better join me and let's go. Teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday school lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Sunday school is now in session. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Sunday school is now in session. As says two of my granddaughters, today is another lovely day and welcome to another edition of the Sunday school lesson that's taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries, Church of God in Christ. And we're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. Our zip code is 60620. Do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen, if, if this is your first time, please make sure that you leave me a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School and thank you for studying with us. Do me another favor, make sure you hit that thumbs up, hit that like bell, and make sure that you subscribe to this channel, hit that bell notification, and be sure to click the word all so YouTube will notify you through email and weekly. Bing. Brother Jones just uploaded another lesson. Two announcements. Announcement one, number one, I'll say it at the end. I will be in Houston, Texas on the 20th, which means I may not be going live on the 21st. If I do go live, I will be live in Houston, Texas. Today we're dealing with Son of God. We have three different passages of long scriptures, Church of God in Christ. We're at Psalm 89, verses 35 through 37. Then we jump to Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And lastly, the first chapter of the book of Matthew, verses 18 through 21. Yes, this is the Kojic Legacy edition of the Sunday School. And the date is April 21st, 2024. Uh, happy birthday and happy anniversary to those of you who this is your time. Uh, today, let's deal with... Uh, the Bible truth is our decisions affect the future of our descendants. Our decisions, the decisions that we make, it actually does affect the future of our descendants. Possibly because the fact that in the last segment of this lesson, Joseph did not want to put his wife away privately. Some say privy. Had he done that, then Jesus never would have been born. So that decision that he made affected the future of our descendants. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your glory and your honor. We pray that as we're going to this lesson, that something is said to edify your body and your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get into Let's get right into here and let's see what we got here. Welcome. Yes, yes. Verses number 35 says, Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Once, 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 he says, the writer or God, he says once. He did this once. And you're going to find out that this once is actually meaning once and for all. One time he swore. Have I sworn? The word sworn means to really make an oath. Now, God could not swear by nobody greater than him. So he had to swear by himself because there is no one greater 
than God. There is no one holier than him. And thereby he says that I had to swear, not by man, I had to swear by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute because it might be uh, what we call a slight misunderstanding of what the writer is saying. So the Lord swore a single oath concerning his servant, David. Since there is no greater, he swore by his own holiness. Holiness is one of the attributes of God himself. And to be holy means to be separated. It means to be purified and sanctified. And since holy is an attribute of and a characteristic of God, when we are holy, we are portraying or taking on one of his attributes itself. So to be holy really means to be saved, separated, and to be removed from what is called common. We have what's called holy vessels. And when we take those holy vessels and put it among and use it in an ordinary way, then they cease to be holy. We have defamed them. And so God says that he swear by his holiness, which really means he swear by his very existence because God is holy. And the Bible says in Titus 1 and 2 that it is impossible for him to lie. He says once, once, which means once for all, I swore by my holiness. I swore, which means to take an oath. And so God took an oath. When he took this oath, he took this oath and he made a promise and also a covenant. Now, he says that I will not lie unto David. I'm going to come back to that because that word, that phrase that was mentioned, King James. Now, if you have other translations, you will see that there is an if, if I, if to die or if to David, I lie. And I don't want to bring confusion, but I need you to understand that that is part of the oath. What he just said. Let me kill this before my phone start ringing off the hook again. He says that I will not lie unto David. So the term should read, if to David I lie. Uh, oaths were made with certain type of statements behind the oath. In other words, if I break this oath, may this happen to me. But with God, he doesn't have to say, may this happen. He just makes the one part, if I lie, if I break this, uh, uh, if I lie to David. Uh, let's see another way to put it. Uh, who was that? Peter, the Bible says, yes, in Matthew 26 and 74, that he said Peter swore an oath when he denied Christ. Now, the Bible says that he cursed, not cussed. We always say that Peter cussed, cursed worse than a sailor. That word is not C-U-S-S-E-D. The word is C-U-R-S-E-D. In other words, he swore an oath to himself. In other words, it would sound like this. If I'm lying, may I die? So it's a, what he says is, is uh, if to David I lie. I'll leave it at that and I pray that it doesn't get confused because, uh, and another reason why I wanted to bring that up is he says, once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. He didn't swear that he would not lie unto David. He swore by his holiness concerning David and his seed and inside of that he will not be falsified by david or david would not be able to say that the lord was not honest with what he says also i want to put a point in them the fact that regardless of what israel did that is still going to come true because god's oath is not subject to man's sin Write that down. God's oath is not subject to man's sin. When God swears an oath is going to take place and it is irre irrevocable, you cannot reverse it. It is irreversible as well. It's a done deal. When God makes that promise, it's done. It's not based on sin or man. The Bible says that word sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound yes my servant 
or unto David, which he has called David his servant throughout Scripture. Here it is, his seed, his seed. Number one, his seed. What's going to happen? His seed is going to endure. He is going to endure for a very long time, forever. Now, I'm not going to go into the fact that forever means a dispensation because the millennial reign is a thousand year. That's the time, that's the season of the forever. He says not only his seed, but his throne also. Now watch this. As the sun before me, it, it, what is the it? His throne shall be established. How long? Forever. As the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. This word means to pause. It means to rest. Sila means to let at times to let the musician continue while we think and reminisce on the song or the statement that has just been said. So the oath made is that the seed of David, which is Jesus, would endure forever. Number two, Jesus Christ is the seed called the son of David, and he is the son of Abraham, according to Matthews 1 and 1. Mm -hmm. So the seed of David is also Jesus, the son of the living God, Matthew 22 and 42, which is we call the, the, the subject us called son of David. God promised David that his house and his throne would be forever. Second Samuel 7 and 16, two weeks ago, that was our lesson. He also promised him that he will establish his kingdom. Second Samuel 7 and 12. Mm -hmm. So the throne of the seed of David, which is Jesus, shall be established as the son is before God. There is two witnesses that he places here called the heavenly bodies the sun and the moon, and I'll bring that up in a minute. He says his seed, which means his descendant, his offspring, and his children shall endure, which means to be or and to exist. His seed shall exist forever, which means continual existence, perpetual, everlasting, indefinite or unending future. The Bible says, according to Acts 2 and 38, that God will raise up Christ to sit on the throne of David. The Lord God shall give unto us the throne of his father, David, speaking in reference to Jesus. That's Luke, the first chapter, verses number 32. Then it says that he shall reign over the house of David forever. Luke 1 and 32 It's a reference to Jesus. And the Lord God of hosts was with David and he will be with his seed, 2 Samuel 5 and 10. He says his throne, which means his seat, which also means his authority, is going to be there forever as well. Now, he says it shall be established forever as the moon. Established means to be firm, to be secure and or to be enduring. It's going to stay forever. Here is a part that might be slightly confusing and I'm going to pull it up. Let me see if I can change the color here. He says it, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. That faithful witness here, ladies and gentlemen, is the moon. Uh, don't look at this word because some of you all, you might have this word in italics. That means it's not part of the original. So the sun and the moon are the faithful witness to the power and word of God. Ever since God spoke them into existence, they are still there, according to Genesis 1. Even uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and 5 that we are kept by the power of God. So what God is really saying is, that the earth and the, the, I should say, the sun and the moon are witnesses to the power of God. Because when God said, let there be a sun and a moon, he placed one over the day and one over the night, they still there. This earth is thousands of years old and it still exists. So those are witnesses of his power, of his authority, 
of his creative power and everything. He says, as those are witnesses and as they are still standing, so shall this come to pass as well is how that should read. All right, let's jump on over to Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. What did it say? It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now the writer so wonderfully says, unto us a child is born, unto us. Notice how he is, goes from being a child to being a son. He is born and he is born for the purpose of being given to us. Then he speaks of the future of the son which we now understand is Jesus Christ. The government shall be put upon his shoulder. His name shall be called. Now, I need you to understand many times the word name means your reputation, your glory, your character, that what you are made out of. You are called by what you are known for. Preachers are called preachers because they preach. Pastors are called pastors because they pastor. Bishops are called bishops because they bish. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Stop it, Jones. Wonderful counselor. He's called the mighty God, the everlasting father, and he's called the prince of peace, which will bring so much confusion to so many people. Let's see what we can talk about. So Isaiah prophesied prior to this particular verse that there would be victories that would take place with Israel and with Judah. He stated that the people who walked in darkness have seen the light or great light in verses number two. Those that live in the land of the shadow of death, light has shone upon them. And if you go into the New Testament in Matthew 4, 13 to 14, you will see that that's referring to Jesus. He is that light. And not only that, that's where he would get a lot of his disciples. He said the people of Judah would be able to rejoice before the Lord as one would rejoice in the harvest. The Lord would break the yoke of the slavery and the burden off of their neck. And all this is going to happen because of this son that would be born. This son that would be born would be given unto the people. He was not just born, but he was born for the purpose of being given to the people. And this child was to be born unto them, he says, unto us. The Bible said that he came to his own. First, oh, that's John 1, 14 through 1, 11 through 14, and they didn't receive him. This child will be born of a virgin. That's Isaiah 7 and 14. So this son would be both God and king at the same time. So Jesus came to the lost sheep of Israel, which would be his own people unto us, Matthew 15 and 24, but they rejected him. So this son will have a sixfold name called as his attributes. He would be called wonderful. He would be called counselor. He would be called mighty God. He will be called everlasting father. He will be called the prince of peace. And then he says, and the government, which means the rule, the dominion or the empire would be on his shoulder. To carry the government on one shoulder is to bear the burden of the rulership. Jesus, the light, will carry this burden upon his shoulder. He will wear the government like one would wear a garment. He shall rule. The government shall be vested in this son, which is called the son of light. Number two, it says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Name means a reputation. It's a fame, a glory, a character. Name is given as a mark or a memorial of individuality. 
I knew I could get that word straight. I can't do it a second time. He will be called wonderful, which implies a miracle or a marvel, something unusual. And his birth was a miracle. It was a miraculous birth. Luke 1 and 35. He performed many miracles on the earth, John 12 and 37. So he will be called wonderful. His reputation, he will be known as, even from his birth, it was miraculous. He would also be called counselor, which means to devise, to consult, to advise, or to give counsel. He performed many miracles upon the earth, and this was his character as well. He taught as one having authority and not like the scribes, Matthew 7 and 29, because he would be called counselor. Then he would be called the mighty God. Now that word God here means El, it's El, which means strength, which means the strong one. He would be called the strong one or strength. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. The deeds that would be performed in his body would be due to the fact of the Holy Ghost, Acts 10 and 38. And the works that he did would be done by his father. That's John 14 and 10. I love that because that tells me that if Jesus could perform all of these acts through the Holy Ghost, he says the things that I do, you could do and greater. The reason why is just because I go to the father. Now, so what that means is every work that Jesus performed, God did it through him, through the Holy Spirit. So we can never say, well, Jesus could do that. I can't do that. The only reason he did it, because it was God's will, it needed to be done, and he done it through the Holy Spirit. Which means if it's God's will, if it needs to be done, we can do it through the Holy Spirit. Yes, we can. Can. He's going to be called the everlasting father because he is the father of salvation. He is the father of eternity. He is the source or the reason of salvation. He established salvation for us. Therefore, he is the father of it. Anything, anyone male that establishes something, uh, starts something, births something, it's called the father. He says he's going to call, be called the prince, the prince of peace. The word prince means a chief, a ruler, a captain. He has immediate authority as the leader. Yes, those are the things that Isaiah said would take place with this son who would be born. Then he says, of the increase of his government. Of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. There shall be no end upon the throne of David. Watch this. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. It's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will actually perform this and cause this to happen. This is why it is going to happen because the zeal, the zeal, the zeal, the zeal of the Lord. So his government and its peace will never come to an end. He will rule with equity, with righteousness and with justice from the throne of David. It's not going to be like your average king or like your other kings. They are operating in selfish mode. They operate in emotion. They operate through bribes. But this king is going to operate in judgment, in justice, in righteousness, in holiness, and in truth. This same one. Jesus as king will establish a righteous kingdom and he will reign with righteousness because God promised David that he would have a son that would reign on the throne. Second Samuel two. And Jesus is the son of David that will reign on this throne in the stead of David, Matthew one and one. And God's zeal is going to cause this to happen, which means it cannot be removed or revoked reversed, 
undone, unspoken, or any of the unfamily. <laughs> Or the end family, irre, ir, the ear, irrevocable. Yes, it's going to happen because the zeal of the Lord is going to cause this to take place. He's going to be a righteous king, uh -huh, a righteous judge. Then we jump down to Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 21. Now we get into the, uh, the gooder stuff. The birth, we get into the birth of Jesus. Remember, his last name is not Christ. Christ is who he is. He is the Messiah. Because the word for Messiah in the Old Testament is called Christ in the New Testament. It was He was born on this wise when as his mother, his mother Mary, watch what was going on with Mary, she was espoused to Joseph. All of this we're getting ready to talk about is going to happen before they came together to consummate the wedding, the marriage. She was found with child. But Luke, uh, Matthew right off the bat lets us know the reason she was pregnant was because of the Holy Ghost. Yes. And there was only one virgin birth. So Matthew calls Jesus by his earthly name and title. Jesus being his earthly name given by God before conception. Luke 1 and 31, which means he shall save his people from their sin. Christ is his earthly title. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And Jesus is the Lord Christ. That's Luke 2 and 26. So Matthew says that the Messiah who they were looking for is to be born by Mary. Luke says that Mary was a virgin. That's Luke 1 and 27. When you put all that together, Isaiah said that a, a virgin shall give birth. Here is the connection. Number two, Matthew continues to show his readers the connection of Jesus as being the heir to the kingdom or the throne of David. A, he shows his readers how unique Jesus' birth is. Remember, he's going to be called um, uh, all of those different names, one of which would be miracle. Jesus would not have a normal birth nor a normal life on earth. He places Jesus in the genealogy of both Abraham and David. He shifts to the parents of Jesus after making uh, the genealogy connection. This lineage is the line of Jesus through Joseph's legal, uh, through Joseph. Jesus is what we call the legal father. Showing the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew puts Joseph and Mary. Now, when you deal with genealogies, it's important to the Jews, to their culture, because they all place themselves back to David and or back to Abraham. Mary and Joseph were espoused, which means to ask in marriage or to woo. I'm not even going to sing that song. Can you? Uh, it means to be betrothed, to be promised in marriage. So their marriages were arranged by different people. So the scripture didn't say if a man finds a wife, the scripture says whoso finds a wife because the man didn't always find his wife. Ishmael's mother found him a wife in Genesis 21 and 21. Abraham sent his servant to get a wife for his son Isaac, Genesis 24. And Isaac sent his son to get a wife uh, from his mother's family, Genesis 28 and 1. Samson asked his parents to arrange his marriage, <laughs> Judges 14 and 2. And Paul says, I've espoused you to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. So the scripture says, whoso finds a wife. That's Proverbs 18. So before Joseph and Mary came together to consummate the marriage, she was found to be pregnant. So the first part of the uh, espousal was the agreement. The second part would be the wedding ceremony. Then the third part would be the banquet, which lasted a week. 
And the fourth part would be the actual consummation of the wedding. That's when the husband and the wife goes into the bed chamber. But the problem is, before they got to consummate to get into the bed chamber, Joseph found out that she was pregnant. But Matthew swiftly informs the reader the reason she was pregnant is because she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her pregnancy was done by God through the Holy Spirit because prophecy has to be made. It has to be fulfilled. Then Joseph, her husband, now watch what the type of person he was. He was a just man and it was not his will to make her a public example. Husbands and wives need to look at that. He didn't want to make her a public example. So what was going on was he was minded to put her away privately. Some says privately. Privately. Now, Joseph was an honorable man. So during the waiting period between Joseph and Mary, he discovers that she's pregnant. If Joseph marries her now, the people will know something. If he breaks off the marriage, he has to explain why. Hmm. If he denies that he did anything, she would be stoned. And Joseph is put in a tough situation. What does he do and how? During this pressure, we will see what Joseph is made out of. I need to holler at somebody right quick because sometimes we get put in a dilemma and we don't know which way to go, but every move that you make will cause some type of or form of explanation that would need to be made. How do you get out of a situation? Don't know about you, but I have been in some quagmires where I had to either explain, but in my explanation, I wanted to cover the other person. Here, Joseph didn't want to make a public example of this woman. And so what he was trying to do is figure out how can I put her away privately without bringing a discredit, a dishonor to her and also to her family. Many people would have just, just posted her on social media. Here's questions I wanted you to ponder. Number one, what would you do and how would you handle certain situations in life? Number two, would you expose all parties that appear to be guilty? Number three, would you speedily throw them under the bus, as we say in today's term? Number four, would you cover the person until you come up with a plan to help? What would Jesus do? So Joseph is now called her husband, but espoused in the previous verse. In their culture, to be espoused, espoused is the same as being married. So they could not step out on one another, although they were not consummated. That's the same thing as uh, adultery. And Matthew gives a brief description of the type of man that Joseph was. He was a just man, which means righteous man, which means he will be one conforming to what's right. He was not willing which means to will, to, to desire, implying active volition and purpose. He was not willing to put her away, to lose her from him, to untie her um, betrothism. Because <laughs> if he did that, he would offer her a bill of divorcement. But he was not willing to do that. Here is something I want to put out here. Compassion over conviction. Mm. Joseph, being a just man, chose not to convict Mary. He chose to put her away secretly without making a lot of noise about her. As children of God, we should follow the same footstep. Let me continue this lesson. Ah, Verse number 20 says, but, oh my God, I thank God for that right there. Mm. This took place, watch this, while he thought, on these things while he thought on these things behold God came down the angel of the Lord appeared unto him where in a dream and this is what this angel said unto him now notice what the angel called him thou son 
of David. Mm. That's a mouthful. He took him way back. Now, when he says, thou son of David, the reader now understands that Joseph is Jesus' father. If Joseph is his father, then Joseph come from the house of David that gives Jesus the right to sit on the throne. When he tells them that he was born of a virgin, that gives him right also because Isaiah said that the virgin would give birth to a child. And the way Isaiah said it is when she gives birth, she will still be a virgin. He called him son of David. First thing he says, fear not to take, take, take unto you Mary. Look at what he called Mary, your wife. He explains to them because the reason is that she is conceived, that, that what she is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. In other words, he says, God did this. Don't be fearful. Don't be afraid to take your wife, to take Mary unto you, son of David, because she has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. She is the one that everybody has been prophesying and waiting to take place. This version and you being a just man, because see, God couldn't have done it to any and everybody. He could only do this to a just man. The Bible said he thought on these things. The word thought, let me, let me pull this up. The word thought means to revolve, to, to, re, to revolve thoroughly in the mind, consider carefully, to ponder, and even to reflect. This was apparently too much for him to process. And the Lord doesn't even wait until he finished this. The Bible says that while he thought on these things, what things? The fact that he is engaged and to what he knows is to be a virgin. The fact that he finds out that she's pregnant. The fact that he's thinking how he can put her away. And the fact that he was thinking about how he can keep her from being placed in an open public shame. That's because he loved them. He wasn't trying to expose her. He was loving her. So the angel had to tell him, don't put her away because she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She is the completion of uh, uh, Isaiah 7. It says, and watch this. He says, and she shall bring forth a son. So right off the bat, this man already knows that his wife is pregnant. Oh, he knew that already. And that she's going to bear, which means the child is not going to die. And he knows that this is going to be a son. He tells him what you're going to do is you're going to call his name Jesus, which means he shall save his people from their sin. Ah. For he shall save his people from their sins. That is this lesson, ladies and gentlemen, the son of David. So he gives them the power of intel. He explains to him in detail what's taking place. First, he says she's pregnant. Next, she's pregnant of the Holy Ghost. Third, she's going to bring forth a child. Fourth, she's going to bring forth a child, and this is what you're going to name the son. He next tells Joseph that he shall name this baby Jesus. He gives the definition of the name as well. When he gives the definition, that also tells him what this child is going to be. Oh, my God. He's going to save his people from their sins. Now, understand this. That full information of people is all of us. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I will be in Houston, Texas this weekend. I'm flying out Friday morning, so I'll be in Houston Friday afternoon, and I will be hungry. I want to find somebody, and let's get something to eat before I have to teach this class uh, Saturday, April 20th at Meadowbrook Baptist Church. Holla at your boy, those of you that are in Houston, Texas. My friend, uh, Minister 
uh, Charlton is going to meet me there. His YouTube channel is called Just Teach Ministries. He's another Sunday school teacher. I want to uh, fellowship with him. Uh, listen, if you want to support this ministry, there it is. These are the ways that you can support this ministry. I appreciate you. I'm moving forward because of the time. And I thank God for your many blessings. And for those of you that reached out and wished me a happy anniversary. And those of you that saw the live stream, I appreciate you uh, for that as well. Uh, we ended up giving $800 out as an investment. I challenged every child at the church, including the new ones that was only a week or two. I challenged them for every A, I'm going to give you $10 at my anniversary. And if you get straight A's, I'm going to give you an extra 20 just for that. One young man, oh, we had a lot of straight A's. You hear me? They broke my bank. But I praise God for some of the things that was there raised a lot as well. They went, they re almost hit the halfway point. And so the rest of it still came from me. But it's an investment. And those of you that still want to invest in those young folk, listen, if you send anything for education, type in their education. Let me put that back up. If you send anything for education, type education, and I will make sure those young people get it. We have one young lady, Serenity, who was trying to get a scholarship to go to college. She's getting ready to graduate, and I support graduations, graduates, and education and young people. I will not most likely be going live on this coming Sunday. I will still be in um, Houston. So if y'all want to connect, let's talk. We'll go to a restaurant or whatever the case may be. I think Minister Lewis or Elder Lewis already has a spot for us to meet. Remember my model, teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. And the model of the Sunday school of the Church of God in Christ, a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. And amen. And I'm just going to play a clip of my sons, Rodney, Paul, John, and Lawrence, and I, uh, a couple, uh, maybe six, seven, eight years ago when we just decided we wanted to jam sex. Come on, Kamitris. Talk to me. Thank you for joining the Sunday School lesson today with Dr. Rodney Jones. If you enjoy what you heard, please like and subscribe to this channel. Thank you.